did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature but instead follow the spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So let so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal body by this same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. We're going to speak a few moments today on this subject, how to get away with murder. to get away with murder. Paul here is speaking to the church at Rome and he's letting them know that since you are now in Christ Jesus, you're no longer obligated or subject to sin because it brings forth death. It brings forth death. And he was talking about how the spirit and the flesh are at constant war with each other. And that he was saying that we have to put the to death the things of the flesh. We have to put the, the, to death the things of the flesh. And Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to be my follower, my disciple, first he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. In other words, Jesus was saying, you got to die. If you want to follow me, you got to die from your sinful nature. You got to die from the things of, of, of your flesh that causes you to sin against me. And there is a show that's been on for a few years that's come on and Thursday nights is called How to Get Away with Murder. And this lawyer, she teaches her students on how to deal with criminal cases and how to get by with stuff that the law would hold you accountable for. And she said, the way to get away with murder is to bury the evidence. And here today, we come to bury some things today. We come to bury some natures and some attitudes and some things in us that are not right. We come to bury some stuff. We're going to commit murder today, and it's going to be legal in the spirit. There are some things that's got to die in us. There are some things that we got to put to death. Paul say, I mortify the deeds of my flesh. And every day, Paul say, I'm crucifying this flesh every day. Every day, because he said, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are no longer condemned. But if we are in Christ Jesus and we are not living according to the word of God, then we are committing and trespassing against God's law. And the Bible, Paul wrote to the church at Rome in the 12th chapter. He said, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not confused. Formed to this world, but be ye 
transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, Paul said, it's time to present your body as a living sacrifice. Every day you got to wake up killing you. Every day I got to wake up killing me. Because sometimes we get up, we have purity, you know what in us. Sometimes we wake up with attitudes and we don't want to talk to people and we don't want to smile and we don't want to do what's right. But Paul said, it's your reasonable service to put your flesh to death. It's time to commit murder. It's time to wake up. When you wake up in the morning, you ought to be saying, I feel this attitude coming on. Let me go in prayer. I feel like I'm going to have a bad day. I feel like I'm going to go off on somebody. So let me get my spirit in check. And you want to know how to get away with murder? Bury that stuff that's on the inside. Bury those attitudes. Bury those situations that you know that you're ready to go off on somebody about. In other words, how can we shout? And how can we be hickam a sign and shouting and all this stuff? And we don't want to kill ourselves. There is no way you can have been in a conference, in a, in a presence of God, and wake and get out and still don't speak to folk bishop. I got a problem with that. How can you say you done been in worship and you won't get stuff right? How you can say that you done taught a message and you still can't love folk? There's some things that got to be put to death. God said it's time to bury it now. It's time to bury it. But we like to resurrect dead stuff. We like to go and pull up stinking stuff. We like to go and get stuff that's not like God. But one thing I found out, that when you have an experience with God, that you are never the same. How to get away with murder. When they brought the sacrifice to the altar, the altar was not a beautiful place in the temple. It was a place where blood was shed. Things were cut out. It was messy. It wasn't a beautiful place. When we come to this altar, it ought to be some nasty stuff left at the altar. It ought to be some hatred left at the altar. It ought to be some jealousy left at the altar. It ought to be some backbiting left at the altar. It ought to be some unforgiveness left at the altar. There ought to, oh God, I bless you. There ought to be some angels in heaven ready to come clean the altar up every time we leave because there's some spiritual stuff that's down on the inside of us that needs to be cut out. There are some things that we need to get rid of. There are some people that we need to go back and get it right with. But we're going to still bunk. We're going to still shout. We're going to still praise and get up as if God is pleased. But God say, kill it. Present your bodies. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, every time I'm in the presence of God, something should be coming off. Every time I'm in worship, something should be coming off. Every time I'm in the Word, something should be coming off. The sacrifice, the altar was a bloody place. It was a constant killing. Every time they brought the sacrifice to the altar, he said, cut out the bad parts. Oh, I bless God. I thank God that I'm letting them cut out some bad parts. I ain't got there yet, but I'm letting them cut out some bad parts. I don't do what I used to do. I don't say what I used to say. I don't go where I used to go. I don't hate like I used to hate. I'm letting God cut some stuff out because I want to live in the spirit. I want to experience God. Paul said that I might know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the resurrection of his power. But Paul said, I want to apprehend that that's already apprehended me. He said, I haven't got there yet. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and preaching for the things that are before me, I press toward the mark. You got to press toward the mark. And you got to get some things cut out. You got to give some things up. understand what the altar was really about because if we really understood what the altar was really put in the temple for we would walk away better every time when you know you had an order 
against somebody. When you left the altar, you went and hugged the neck. The Bible says, if you know that your brother has an altar against you, he say, leave your money, leave your praise, leave your worship, and go be reconciled to your brother. be my disciple. He said, if you want to be my disciple, you got to deny yourself. You got to know that it's not all about you. It's not all about how you feel. It's not about your opinions. It's not about what you think. It's what God says. And too much of us done been mixed with too much of the word. And we done pushed him out and put our own dictates in and say what we going to do and how we going to do it. And in the manner that we going to do it and we think is right. But one thing I know we can't change God's word. was a place of dying because when you come up here and die you can live how dare we come to a holy altar and take the sacrifice back that we supposed to get because we refuse to change I'm at the altar but I'm still not going to speak to you I've been in worship but I still don't love you I've been in the presence of God, but I ain't going to forgive him, even though God showed me in worship how much he really loved me. We have to examine our ways. There are some things. See, that's why we can't be examining other people's ways. We got too much stuff of our own self to work out. I can't be putting you in check when I got to check myself. I can't be talking about your shortcoming when I got so much I got to work on. I don't have time to be caught up with what you're dealing with, and I ain't dealing with what I need to deal with. See, that, 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 but, but, but it's easy to look at other people's faults. It's easy to point out their so, your shortcoming and say how bad they are. But then when we're in the mirror of God and he show us, then God, you know my heart. Well, if he know your heart, he knows their heart. was a perfect example that he encountered people that didn't love him. He encountered people that didn't like him. But not one time when we read that Jesus hated anybody. He loved on everybody because he understood that I can't accomplish my mission if I'm not doing the will of the Father. The problem is we want to try to accomplish the mission and don't do the will of the Father. And we look behind us and we got dead bodies and injured folk all behind us and won't go back and get this stuff right. We got all this stuff and we shouting all over it and we speaking in tongues all over it and we walking over it like we all right. And you don't hurt sister so and so so feeling. You don't hurt brother so and so. And you know you did it because you intentionally did it. And you won't go back and say I'm sorry. But this is the day that they commit murder against this stuff. Paul knew what it was to deal with struggles. He knew what it was to deal with the struggle. He knew the nature of the flesh and the spirit. Paul said the law is good. There's nothing wrong with the law. He said the trouble is with me. He said because the very thing I hate, I do. The very thing I say I wouldn't do, I find myself doing it. Paul said there's a war going on in my members. But Paul also said mortify the deeds of your flesh. Because if we don't kill it, it's going to grow. Sometimes we're inflicting stuff on people that ain't had nothing to do with why we feel the way we feel. Some folk are inflicting stuff because you mad because things that went wrong in your life, now it's my fault. When it's really some underlying stuff that's going on. And we don't want to deal with the underlying stuff. But Paul said, if we mortify the deeds of the flesh, we put to death 
the things that's in us that's not like God. Paul knew that there was no good thing in him. Paul said, in me, in this flesh, there is no good thing. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this? But he said, thank God for Jesus Christ. But we got to learn to die every day. See, because this, see, it's, it's not the devil all the time. We give him too much credit. And he'll definitely take the credit. But we say, the devil this, the, why, why is every time you're going through a spiritual warfare, why can't be some decisions you made that cause you to be going through what you're going through? Why has everything bad happened got to be the devil? There are some things we put into play. There are some things that we've done that we caused ourselves to be in, and we want to blame it on the devil because we don't want to face the reality that we got some underlying issue. It's easy to blame somebody else for our situation instead of saying, Lord, I did it, help me. through spiritual warfare, the devil on my track. But see, you forgot what you put in the plate. Because you thought what you did was right. You thought you were justified in doing what you did when it backfired. Now it's the devil. And the easiest thing to do is just fess up and say, Lord, I messed up. Let me go back and backtrack and get this stuff right so I can get your approval and I can grow and be better than what I was before. But because of pride and arrogance, we won't do it because we don't want to look like that we are, we're weak and that we are we're vulnerable and we're subject to make mistakes because we want to put on an outside plate to let everybody know I'm strong in the Lord. I'm mighty in God. Do you not? know the mightiest people have fallen? Do you not know Peter denied Jesus? But he told Paul, in your weaknesses, that's when you made strong. Uh, I thank God for some thorns that he given me to keep me from becoming arrogant. Paul didn't understand it until Jesus had to break it down to him. He asked him three times to remove the thorn from his flesh. And if he just went ahead and told him, well, if I remove it, then you're going to get arrogant. Because I've shown you some things I haven't shown other men. I've given you some revelations that other people will never get. And if I don't give you a thorn to let you know you got to rely on me and you are weak and you're vulnerable, then you're going to get arrogant. I thank God for some struggles that I'm dealing with right now because they keep me on my face. Had God cleared everything out my way, I know I'd have got arrogant. I could talk about me. That's why I thank God that every time I get through preaching or get through doing anything, I thank God that the Spirit of God speaks to me and say, keep yourself humble. Stay humble before me. If it had not been for me, you couldn't have opened your mouth. So you stay humble because there is a spirit of pride that's standing by you when you get through ministry to tell you that you did something. And I know in me how the struggle was to get the message. So I thank God for the struggles even in my studies that sometimes I don't understand what God is saying. He'll give it to me at the last minute. He'll give it to me when I'm standing up. I thank God for the struggles that he put in my life to make me stay humble. Humble. I thank him for those struggles. You ought to thank God for your thorn and quit asking him to move it. There were some thorns he put in your life to keep us humble. There is a spirit of arrogance that operates with preachers and people in authority in the body. There, that spirit waits on you to get through to take the glory from God. That's a spirit of the enemy that tell you that you did it. And when you know, but if you really know yourself, you know you didn't do it. You know some of that stuff that wasn't even in your mind when you when you were studying. But the enemy is quick and he's crafty and he will fool and deceive the very elect of God. That's why I got to say this. I'm gonna say it, Mother Benjamin, because you told me I can say it. Let me tell you something, worshipers. Let me tell you something, worshipers. Wait, my worshiper. Okay. Let me say my, my worshipers. Worshipers, that's here. I'm seeing some things that these new millennial worshipers, they've got a problem with the word. 
They'll worship all day. They'll worship all day, but when the word comes, they're missing. They're on Twitter. They're on Facebook, and it's all right, and you're knowing it. You are knowing it, but you got to get some stuff in you because it ain't all about worshiping. It's about the word. It's the word that's going to keep you. Don't think just because you up here that that's all it is. You got to get in the word. You ought to be found in Sunday school. You ought to be found in Bible study. You ought to be found in the word of God because that's a trick of the enemy. Because if we don't enforce it, it's going to continue. And if it continues, they're going to be, they're going to be, have a wopsided gospel. See, they can't have a wopsided gospel if they're going to carry on the church. Because, see, the thing is to build on the foundation that's already there and to make it better. And so we got to enforce some stuff and say, if you can't be here in Sunday school or Bible study, then you don't need to be up with a mic in your hand. I ain't scared. I got to be here, you got to be here. I want to stay home too and watch Wheel of Fortune. But I get up, on, I come in running from work on Monday night. I'm tired, my blood pressure slightly up, but I'm sitting in the corner because I realize God's been good to me and I owe God my allegiance. It's going to cause for some sacrifice. It's going to call up for some killing. See, some things got to be killed. And, and it's not that you're a bad person. You're just slightly misguided. But, you know, that's why we're here to guide you in the right direction and say, look, now, we, we, we know you're anointed. You, you're anointed. God knows you're anointed, but you ain't ready. Why I ain't ready? Because I can't find you in Bible study. I can't find you in Sunday school. You, God knows you're ready. You're anointed, but you ain't ready. When David, when David was anointed, king of Israel, it was a private anointing. He did not have an audience. It was his brothers, Samuel, and his daddy. David got anointed. He went back to dealing with the sheep. He went back to dealing with the goats, the lambs, and whatever livestock his father had. He went right back there and waited 17 more years before he took the throne. And when he got his public, his public anointing, then he had the crowd. But this is different now. We want the crowd before the public anointing. See, see the word has been spoken, but you want the crowd. That's the spirit of arrogance that waits on us. David was anointed. He waited till he was 35. He had to wait because Saul was still the king. Even though he was rejected, God didn't move him until 17 years later. You can't go too soon. If you go too soon, you're going to mess some folk up. Well, there's some stuff you got to go through. You got to have some battle scars. Those battle scars help you to realize and stay humble that God brought me through all of this. That's why I got a problem with these now apostles. They are popping up everywhere, all over the city and country. On every corner, you got apostle. He's 25 years old. It's him and his wife, two children and an old lady. And now I'm the apostle. And six months later, he's the chief apostle. Ain't sat under nobody, ain't been trained, ain't been made, ain't been developed. But now I'm an apostle because you done got a shake, you done got an anointing, and now you're ready to run, and your pastor don't know no better now. Now you know more than him because God done anointed you, and your anointing is connected to your leader. So how in the world can you be greater than your leader? How can the branches be greater than the tree? Branches will fall off a tree, and the tree will still be standing. But there's some things that we got to kill. And some of us seasoned saints, them been in God a long time, no protocol. 
no order. Out of order and don't care. Longevity don't make you in order. Longevity shows that you know order, but you got to prove that you know order. It doesn't matter if you've been saved 30 years. You can't do what you want to do. God has an order established in the house. But because we don't kill stuff, because we don't put stuff to death, this stuff done breed it, and it done spread it like a canker. One see you doing it, the other one going to do it. I ain't scared. But it's, it, it, see, God calling order for the, for the house. Because do you not know people watch us? You don't have to be saved to know order. There's a lot of people in the military out there how they say they know order. And if people in the natural know how to follow order, how much more do we should follow, we should follow order with the spirit of God living in us because we don't kill stuff, because we don't put stuff to death and say, oh, I'm out of order. We won't go back and correct some stuff. So we keep on rolling, doing the same thing over and over again. God is not pleased. But it's time to bury some stuff today. We're going to lead the altar today. It's going to be a mess in the spirit. God's going to have to dispatch some clean-up angels to come get up some of this mess. To put, come, some, come, come clean up some unforgiveness and, and, and clean up some backbiting and murmuring and disobedience. And, and, and It's going to be a bloody altar today. It's going to be an altar that's bloody. If we're going to be a living sacrifice, it's going to require a certain amount of effort on our part. We're going to have to put to death some things. Because we overlook us. We overlook us. But we see it in somebody else and we want it corrected through them. But what about the stuff in us? What about the stuff we do? I can say, yeah, you late all the time, but you know, it's some stuff in me. say you don't listen to authority, but it's something in me too. I don't have a finger to point. We all got to leave the altar, leave some stuff on the altar today. Every time we come, that's why I always call for an altar call because, you see, we got, but first if you don't understand what the altar is for, in your private study time, you need to Google what the altar was for. Google it. It tells us what the altar was for. That's when we come. So now when we come now, we know, Lord, it's not about me trying to pray for sister so-and-so to leave me alone. It's for me, Lord, to help me to love sister so-and-so. Help me to treat her right. Help me to remove this barrier I got up between us. And, and, and I don't want to, I want to, when I want to, when I want to dance for you, Lord, I want it to be a real dance. When I say hallelujah, I want my hallelujah to be for real. When I hug her, I want her hug to be for real. When I tell her I love her, I want that love to be for real, not a superficial thing that I'm doing just because it's the right thing, that, because it seemed to be the right, but because it's the right thing to do. spiritual knife. You might have to bring a gun. Something, I don't mean I'm spiritual gun. Let me rephrase that. Leave your gun in your pocketbook. But bring your spiritual weapon. Let me rephrase that. Bring your spiritual weapon, not to kill somebody, but to kill you. Sometimes you have to get a little graphic. So when we say mortify, that's something like a good word. Kill, murder. We know about that. We see it every day in the news. We can relate to it. But Paul was writing to this church to say, if you're going to be in the spirit, be in the spirit. Because in the spirit, you cannot please God. In the flesh, you cannot please God. And if we are in the flesh, we're going to do the things of the flesh. 
we don't have that envy, that jealousy, pride, arrogance, disobedience, selfishness, slander, malicious behavior, lying, hatred, evil communication. Those are the things that we're going to feed. So if you want to know how strong you are, check which man you feed. If you're so quick to cuss somebody out, you've you been feeding the wrong one. If you can't forgive, you're feeding the wrong spirit. Because God is love. And God wants us to represent him well. And we cannot continue on this journey with a lot of stuff in us. If we don't start cutting some of this stuff off, we're not going to make it. We're on a slow death, a slow spiritual death if we don't kill some of this stuff. That's why it's easy for some of us not to be in Sunday school and Bible study. Slowly dying. When you once was in here when the door was open, now we can't find you. When you used to attend church and was happy to come, not just obligated, but happy, glad to come. Now it's a, it's a press. Oh, I got to go. There's a slow spiritual death going on. But then you can, and if they go in bodies and cut cancer out, laser it out, you can laser some of this stuff out with the spirit through the word of God. And the more you kill it, the better you'll get it. The more you work on it, the more the better we'll get it. But God is calling us to order. He's calling us into place. God wants to do some great things in us. But see, God just can't give us all this stuff if we don't give nothing back. And the greatest gift he's given us is life. But then what are we doing with this life? What are we doing with this time that we have? Are we killing those things in us? Or are we cutting out everybody else's shortcoming? There is no way in the world nobody's going to run me out of here, Bishop. I wouldn't allow that. God's been too good to me right here. I can overcome some stuff. I can get to the point where if I know I ain't did nothing wrong, I'm sorry, you know, I know I ain't did. Just to make peace. Just to make, and I ain't mad about that I got to do that. It's the fact that I want to live in peace because I've been through too much. And, and, and God done done too much for me. And I understand that when I can't get there, it's something wrong with me. No matter who's at fault, if I can't get to that place, it's something wrong with me. And not if I got all this Holy Ghost I say I got. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Us better. He wants us to be better. He wants us to love one another and love everybody. How will men know that you're my disciples? If they don't see love, they will not know we belong to Christ. We come here every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Monday. We should be better every time we leave. We should constantly be working on ourselves every day, all day, because it's a 24 hour, seven day a week job. Working on me. Because I know me and I know what I need working on me. And I miss the mark sometimes. I don't always do it right. But you know what? I'm striving. Every day I'm striving to do better than I did yesterday. Sometimes I make it and sometimes I don't. But you know what? I haven't stopped. The problem happens when we stop. And then things begin to fester and grow. But God loved us so much that Paul said that we are not obligated to do what our sinful nature urges us. We're not obligated to give in to our sinful nature. Not if we have the spirit of Christ. And we have to put some things to death. We got to kill some things if we want to be his disciples. 